All right, hello everybody, welcome. There is lots of seating up front, so feel free to come on in. Um, there's obviously lots of seating around the edges too. Lots of food. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Jennifer Lawrence and I'm the Executive Director of the Hideo Sasaki Foundation. We are honored that you would take the evening to be with us. Uh, for folks online, can you let us know in the chat that you can hear us? Because we had some technical difficulties earlier today. Good, all right, great. So let's get started. Um, again, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening for such an important conversation about cultural planning, community building, and neighborhood stabilization in Chinatown. We'd also like to wish a very happy Lunar New Year. And if you were lucky enough to get here early, we got some delicious pastries from the Corner Bakery. First off, we'd like to offer a land acknowledgement this evening. This land is the territory of the Massachusetts Pawtucket and their neighbors of Wampanoag and Nipmuc peoples who have stewarded this land for hundreds of generations. We recognize the repeated violations of sovereignty, territory, and water perpetrated by invaders that have impacted the original inhabitants of this land for 400 years. We extend our respect to citizens of these nations who live here today and their ancestors who lived here for over 500 generations and to all indigenous peoples. We also affirm that this acknowledgement is insufficient it does not undo the harm that has been done, and it continues to be perpetuated now against indigenous people, their land, and water. Uh, here at the Sasaki Foundation, we believe design has the power to address the most urgent challenges facing us, from social inequities to the need for climate resilience. Design is an agent of change, and yet access to design for the communities who often most need it most um, is limited. We work at the intersection of research, practice, and community to leverage design to tackle these challenges. In addition to uh, gathering impressive panelists to talk about inequities and solutions, we also host various opportunities to engage with our programs throughout the year. The design grants fund time and space to, sorry, I lost my place, to work on the solutions to some of our, oh, I'll hold on, sorry. The design grants fund time and space for community groups and interdisciplinary teams to work on their solutions to some of our community's most pressing needs. Please watch our mailing list for announcement of this year's round, which will come out in the next month. Um, if you are not yet on our list, I believe anybody who signed up through Eventbrite, you'll be added. But if you have a community group that would like direct distribution, just let us know and we'll add you before the end of the night. Through our design education pillar, we host various high school education and engagement programs, um, such as the SEED program, which many of you know, it's our summer exploratory experience in design. Uh, where students receive paid internships and learn hands-on skills in various design disciplines um, all through the summer. And our applications will be opening up later this winter. So if you also wanna be on that list, please let us know. Um, if you are a Sasaki employee and are interested in vol volunteering for our design education programs, let us know this week. We have some really exciting ones coming up. Architecture and Design Thinking Week comes up in uh, just a month. I can't believe it, in February. Um, and that is a project that we do in collaboration with various firms throughout Boston and the BSA. And we're going to do the official call next week. So if you want to get on the list ahead of time, let me know tomorrow. I would also like to thank our dedicated board members who are here um, and who are not able to be here tonight. Um, they are in charge of the entire direction of our nonprofit organization, and without them, we wouldn't be able to do this work. They do our strategic planning. They serve as people power at our events. You all saw them this evening. Um, they are chairs of our design grants program, and they are the thinkers behind our youth programming. So I'm just gonna call out the folks I know are here. We have Marianne, we have Tao, Chris. You saw Ben and John when you came in downstairs. I don't think they're up here yet. Uh, and I believe Timo is joining us online. So thank you for being here this evening. And none of this would have happened without our amazing staff. So Anna is downstairs, but you all saw her as well. And it's Stephanie, if you can raise your hand. Sabia is here as well. I don't see her, but I know she's here because I saw her. There she is, right in the front. Uh, so thank you so much. 
Um, now I'm just going to do some quick logistics and then we're going to get into the fun of it. So the restrooms are right around this corner. If you don't want to walk up here because you feel like you're getting right in the middle of front of the audience, you can go around. This is a circle right here. So feel free to go right that way. Food and drink, please experience, get up there and get more. Don't let us have as much as we had at the end of our last event. Um, please do keep going up for seconds or thirds or fourths. Um, for folks online, you're all muted and we're going to continue to have you muted. So please keep muted. Um, as, as cute as your dogs are, we don't wanna hear them right in the middle of a really important discussion. Um, and for the chat, I will monitor the chat throughout the whole session, but we can't promise that we'll get to those chat questions throughout this, this night. So what might happen is I'll take it down, I'll copy it and we'll get answers back to you at the end uh, later on. Um, okay, and now we're going to do a quick activity in the spirit of community engagement and planning. This is an interactive activity with your neighbors. So turn to a neighbor or two and just take a minute and talk about what is cultural planning to you? What does it mean? What does that term even mean? And we'll take about two minutes and just talk to one another. And then if folks feel comfortable, a few people can report back, but chat. Okay, would anybody like to report back on what you talked about? What is cultural planning to the folks in this room? You can just yell it out. You don't need to raise your hand. Yeah, bottoms up, people first. Great, anybody else? Yeah. So before you start the planning, you need to immerse yourself and experience the culture and understand it. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Community engagement. We'll have lots to talk about that tonight as well. Yes. Cycling wealth back into the community in the way the community wants. Great. One more. Yeah. Wonderful. So understanding that change is inevitable and that understanding the people who are already here and that that changes for them as well as new people coming in. Did I say that correctly? Great. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Okay. So now on to the main event. Uh, our moderator, Dr. Lily Song, is an assistant professor of race and, uh, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm going to mess this up, in social justice in the built environment for at Northeastern University. She holds a PhD in urban and regional planning from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, an MA in urban and, and regional planning from the University of California, Los Angeles, and a BA in ethnic studies from UC Berkeley. This is not meant to make us all feel horrible, but it does show that she is an expert in this. Lily's research interests lie at the nexus of race, class, and gender politics of space, infrastructure-based mobilizations and experiments, and reparative planning and design in American cities and other decolonizing contexts. Previously, she was a lecturer in urban planning and design at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where she was also the founding coordinator of Harvard Co-Design. And Lily participated in the 2020 Design Grants cohort as a member of the Mattapan Mapping Project. And you can see that work back up against the wall. Thank you so much, Lily, for moderating this panel of fascinating leaders and community experts on cultural planning in Chinatown. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to start with a brief introduction before I introduce our panelists. Um, so the start of this week, as Jennifer touched on, marked the beginning of the Lunar New Year, um, a time of sharing food, honoring our elders, giving and receiving gifts, um, basically channeling the spirit of prosperity and abundance. We are heartbroken by the events in Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay, news of loved ones whose lives were cut short by the most American of tragedies, gun violence. Still, we continue to gather and rebuild from harm. In Boston, Chinatown is home and also home away from home for many. It's one of Boston's oldest neighborhoods, home to vibrant working class communities. 
It's also a vital commercial and cultural district uh, with ethnic products, services, and networks that sustain our rich foodways and lifeways. In Boston, the tensions between making the city more economically competitive through urban redevelopment versus meeting the needs of people that make Boston what it is, these, this tension is especially acutely felt in Chinatown. Chinatown has long faced threats from urban renewal, highway construction, institutional expansion, and downtown expansion. All the while, Chinatown residents, workers, and activists have continued to build spaces of safety and belonging. And this is in part through community-led planning and development. It's, it's a model and inspiration to many. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to introduce our panelists tonight, three remarkable individuals who are at the helm of community-led planning and development in Chinatown. So please join me in welcoming Gina Chang, who's with the Asian Community Development Corporation, Lydia Lowe with the Chinatown Community Land Trust, and Cynthia Wu with the POW Art Center. So to get us started, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to self-introduce their work and why they're involved in the cultural plan in Chinatown. That's gonna be a thing, I think. Okay, hi, I'm Gina Chang. I'm the Director of Programs and Design at Asian Community Development Corporation. It's really great to meet you all. Um, I'm here with Lydia and, and Cynthia, as Lily said, and we're all uh, members of a collective working on a Chinatown cultural plan, which we'll dive into. Not all of us are here, and we'll, we'll share. Um, so we're also missing Metro Area Planning Council members, City of Boston, Arts and Culture members, um, the Greenway Conservancy, and others that we will be engaging in this process. So I'll just introduce our uh, ACDC and myself. Um, in my work, our goal, well, ACDC as a whole, we invest in people and the places they live. And we do that three ways. One is building affordable housing. We know home ownership is uh, a pathway to generational wealth. And the second is actually helping build generational wealth outside of home ownership. So we do housing counseling, but we also do financial literacy classes, especially retirement savings classes for elders who are workers and you don't get that kind of benefits in your job. And then lastly, we do um, community planning and resident leadership with high school students. Shout out to the alumni. I'm not gonna embarrass you here, but <laughs> um, the uh, high school students, as well as um, especially immigrant families um, and middle-aged immigrant families who have parents to take care of and young kids to take care of and don't have time of day to be coming out to these public meetings um, about planning. So the way that we do this, like, I know we all love planning. You're at Suzaki. You're opting to come to an evening midweek event on planning. Um, but for maybe a lot of people, planning might feel like ivory tower. I need a grad degree. I need Lily's <laughs> accreditation. Um, all of those things. But what we really believe is that um, if we use art making, and we we put it out in public spaces where they where residents get to shape the art and get to have conversations on what they want to see um, in their physical space um, that they actually have the power to build their their lived environment and that they should because they are the experts of their lived environment um, and so that's a big part of what we do um, in placekeeping um, and we focus it. We focus these strategies, um, creative placekeeping along the edges of Chinatown. Um, we believe like the edges are where we're seeing the most rapid erosion and displacement. And so it's kind of like a eroding seashore, if you can picture that. And we're trying to shore up, um, stabilize the edges of Chinatown through cultural efforts that lead to like hard power, like soft power of cultural efforts that lead to site control and economic investment. And not just like shore up that edge, but then extend it. Like what would it look like to extend and grow as a Chinatown instead of being seen as like shrinking? Um, so I'll pass it on to Lydia. Thanks. 
So I'm Lydia, and I'm the director of the Chinatown Community Land Trust, uh, which is a fairly young organization in Chinatown, although I have been in Chinatown for many decades. Um, the Chinatown Community Land Trust works for community ownership and control of land, as well as uh, collective governance of shared resources as a strategy and approach to stabilizing Chinatown's future. And um, you know, it, as you know, some of the things that we do are uh, preservation of existing housing as permanently affordable housing through 99 year ground leases, uh, working for and advocating for a historic and Chinatown to be lifted up as a historic and cultural district, uh, working to expand and improve open space and uh, working on issues of environmental justice, including a community-led energy microgrid. So it sounds like a lot of different things. That's one of the things we discovered about being a community land trust is you're actually free to pursue lots of things and lots of strategies. And so more and more, we found ourselves playing a planning role because we weren't limiting ourselves to just housing or just open space, uh, but really trying to look at the community as a whole and what were the things that maybe weren't being addressed or that we needed to bring people together and pay, you know kind of put more attention on. And in terms of cultural planning, I think that, well, first we, we played a leading role together with M the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission on uh, initiating Chinatown Master Plan 2020, uh, which came out in 2020. And um, within the master plan, we started to articulate this important role of Chinatown as a historic and cultural district, but we kind of left it there. And there wasn't any elaboration of what does that really mean? So more and more different organizations in Chinatown were doing a lot of different kinds of public art and cultural work projects. Uh, somewhat in sync with each other, but not completely, and we weren't really discussing it together. And it was because of that that we came together and started talking about having an actual strategy and a coordinated cultural plan. And I think for us, the importance to me is that, um, and I want to quote um, the Cape Verdean revolutionary Amilcar Cabral, you know, who said, Culture is simultaneously the fruit of a people's history and a determinant of history. So, you know, culture is inseparable from the movement. And therefore, to me, you know, the cultural work is really part of building that struggle and building that movement for self determination and for preservation and stabilization of Chinatown's future. Thanks, Lydia. Uh, my name is Cynthia. I am the director of Power Arts Center. I use she, her pronouns. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Power Arts Center, we opened um, a little over five years ago, and we're actually a program collaboration between Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center, BCNC, and Bunker Hill Community College. And our mission really is to uplift AAPI uh, voices in this area of Boston and the New England area. Um, to strengthen and celebrate um, our viewpoints and also community. I think what is so um, exciting about the work at Power Art Center is that, of course, it's it's an art center. It comes with things that you think an art center does. You can see a film, you can see an exhibition, but it's really a testament and an investment by a social service agency and a um, community college to say that arts and cultural practice and creative practice are really essential and as essential to your well being as any of the other things that we think are critical, you know, from learning uh, new immigrants learning English so they can um, get work to childcare. So um, that's for me personally, that's what's really exciting about the work at Power Arts Center and how we look at using arts and creative practice is really to think about how can we make connections? How can we create senses of belonging in our space and in our community? And in some ways it's our responsibility to think about how we can leverage arts and culture to make sure these connections in our community, our neighborhood strong and the connections between the people who identify as part of our community are also strong. Um, and I think it's also important to say that all this work is coming off of so much work from 
organizations and individuals before us. Power Art Center as a program, we're only five years old, but we're really born out of a tradition in Chinatown of grassroots organizing and using and thinking about arts and culture. And we'll talk about that later. Um, so all this work, even the space where we're on is built on all the work that everyone's done before us. Like um, uh, I should say, talking about anchors and <laughs> borders, something it, I should have said before, but that's okay. Um, if you've never been to the space, we are actually on uh, just over that way on parcel 24, which was developed by uh, Asian CDC, which was um, a space in the 60s that was, um, sorry, was taken away from the community um, by the state to build the highway. So for many, the construction of the mixed use space spearheaded by uh, ACDC was a huge reclamation of that space for the community. And for us to have an art center dedicated to the viewpoints of the AAPI and Chinatown community at this border of Chinatown in some ways is also a strengthening of that border on that side, so. Thank you, Three. Um, I'm gonna um, sort of build off something that Cynthia just said about the tradition of grassroots organizing in Chinatown and sort of, you know, standing on the shoulders of, of you know, movement of ancestors and giants, right? And um, Lydia, I, if I could ask you the first question, sort of, could you um, take us through the planning processes that have been occurring in Chinatown over the last 20 years? And, you know, in Boston, there's also been so much learning and sort of multi or cross-racial coalition building as well. And I understand the learning from um, Roxbury, the um, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, and but also how Chinatown has taken that forward in a way that's very appropriate for this part of town and how others are now continuing to learn from Chinatown throughout the region. So if you could give us a brief overview and also, um, sorry, I'm famous for like piggybacking question after question. Um, so how planning has played out over the last 20 years in Chinatown and why the cultural plan is important at this moment. So Chinatown actually was the first neighborhood in the city to have a, a neighborhood plan. And it was more than 20 years ago. It was the Chinatown Community Plan of 1990, which actually was initiated by the BRA, uh, but in conjunction with the community. It was during a period when the BRA was actually working very closely with community groups under Stephen Coyle. And what's interesting, I think, about Chinatown and community planning is I think somebody said, you think about community planning as being kind of academic and driven by experts and professionals. But in Chinatown, that's actually never been the case. Um, it has always been about a more grassroots community process. Um, you know, it's gone through different stages, but basically even when it was initiated by the Boston Redevelopment Authority, it came out of a period of a lot of organizing both in Chinatown and throughout the city for community control of development. And therefore there was always that uh, strong participatory aspect. In the next, every 10 years since 1990, the Chinatown community has taken it upon itself to do its own community master plan. Um, while the city has not. So we had the Chinatown plan, Master Plan 2000, Chinatown Master Plan 2010, Chinatown Master Plan 2020. And um, I think that's something that's unique to Chinatown, that it has always been driven more from the community and through you know, the community thinking about participatory processes and what's the vision that we really want to propose to the city and others. In terms of the cultural plan, I think I spoke a little bit about that and how we felt that was really missing. Um, and I would say that, you know, the one of the goals or one of the principles that we articulated in Master Plan 2020 is that, um, well, the original Chinatown Community Plan of 1990, the overarching goal was to stabilize, was to preserve the working class family neighborhood in Chinatown. 
um, you know, that was a long time ago. Chinatown's no longer just a working class family neighborhood, but it still has a working class family neighborhood within it. And so our goal, overarching goal adapted over time to say, we want to stabilize and preserve the working class immigrant uh, core of the community and its, its historic residential and small business space. Um, so that cultural plan really, we think has to relate to that issue of continuing to celebrate and stabilize Chinatown that has that in a way that it's an identity has always been to be an anchor for immigrant working class families, even before it was called Chinatown. Um, yeah, and something to, to name is the 2020 master plan articulates like housing goals. It, it has goals for wanting economic redevelop recovery and growth, um, housing, transportation, transit-oriented, equitable development, um, access to public realm, and recognizing that arts and culture and this cultural plan is tied to all those things. Like thinking about how you feel safe in public spaces, what makes you feel belonging in public spaces, how that's connected to bringing in people who can actually go to the businesses and result in capital investment in the neighborhood all these things are all connected and so we felt like we just need a process to talk about it and like get on the same page and put it on onto paper and then actually execute it thank you thanks for elaborating um i want to pick up on something that lydia said when um and ask actually let me pick up on something yeah that lydia said and ask cynthia this question so um Lydia, you touched on sort of the working class family base of Chinatown um, and then sort of how the community plan has evolved over the years. And um, Cynthia, the question for you is, who do you see the cultural district, um, who, who's being served today? So who is the cultural district serving? Um, who is it for? I can, I'll start this and then I'm sure if anyone wants to jump in, they can. Um, I think for many people, me included, when I think of the term cultural district, I'm like, oh, this is for tourists. This is for businesses and this is for advantages for them, which is, you know, you know, not really how we work in Chinatown. They're certainly part of the equation. They support, they can come in, they can support a lot of our businesses. Um, and, and be a part of the community in some way. But what we're really trying to kind of think about and discover through this whole planning process that will help define, you know, the output of the culture or, or the cultural district is, you know, who is part of this community and who do we serve and recognize that's also changing. It is, Lydia also mentioned this, that it, you know, um, and I think someone in the audience mentioned this, like, Planning is about thinking about not only preserving the past, but thinking how about how we move forward. And I think a certain for many of us, we do recognize that the composition of Chinatown is also changing. So it is a balance. And through this process, maybe helping us articulate more, you know, finding that balance or who's involved in this plan and who's really represented and who's uplifted um, is not in a vacuum. So I think I don't have a clear answer to that, thinking more of like, this is an open entry to really think through these, like as Gina says, this whole process. I mean, I think that culture really reflects our reality, our social and material reality, and that's constantly changing in Chinatown as Cynthia says, is changing. But it also reflects that, you know, we have to, we kind of also make choices or we define for ourselves, you know, what culture are we uplifting or what, how are we developing our culture? And for us, I think that, you know, we are developing Chinatown and developing Chinatown's culture in an inclusive way, but also in a way that we particularly focus on uh, the importance of uh recognizing and encouraging and maintaining um, its historic immigrant working class base you yeah, know um that makes a lot of sense in terms of the sort of shifting um 
residential base of Chinatown and really making space for that emergent quality, but also really attending to the importance of sort of the shared culture that has sustained people over generations um, and trying to sort of, you know, support a process, right? Um, that allows a sort of, I love that quote that you shared, you know, about cultural self-determination, right? Toward the future as well. Um, Gina, I want to turn it over to you for an activity so that you can kind of show us how, how you work. Yeah. And I by no means own this activity. <laughs> this is like something that I'm sure you all do in your practice as well. But um, if we can, something that we all believe is arts and when we sit in a room and put pen to paper and try to plan, the best ideas don't always come out because we also need to tap other creative parts of us. And that is what arts, um, art making and engaging will allow us all to do. And that's what we want in our own cultural process. Like we don't want to just do that outside for residents and community members. We want to experience that in our own cultural planning process. And so just to invite you all into that, um, if you can close your eyes, and you know, it's like a trust exercise. <laughs> you can close your eyes and just imagine we're all time travelers and we're zooming to the year 2050. And you get out of your machine or your beam down or however you're time traveling and you're dropped into Chinatown. What do you see? Where is the start of Chinatown for you? What do you smell? What do you hear? What can you touch around you? What are you tasting even? And you can move around your space. Imagine it's a Chinatown where you're not worried about where the money's gonna come from. <laughs> And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. And it'd be great if you can turn to maybe the partner you shared with in the beginning or make a new friend and just share a few snapshots, some glimpses. What were the senses you've had? Um, what was your experience of Chinatown? If you had a dystopian Chinatown where it was really eerie, that's fine. <laughs> share that too. And what made it so creepy? <laughs> Yeah. So we're going to wind down the partnered conversations. And we're going to ask for some volunteers. Gina, your activity really got people going, right? Like there's so much to imagine and share. Yeah. Who imagined a dystopian reality or a dystopic future? Interesting. Who imagined food? Shops? Who imagined bumping into people? Interesting. Can we find a volunteer, a couple of volunteers to share back what they imagined? Yes. Oh, lovely. So a car free, active street life with local businesses that reflect the culture, cultures. Interesting. Thank you. Here.
Nice. So deal with the highway, right? And all the noise and air pollution, affordable housing, greenway, small businesses, beautiful. We'll take one here. And then I'm going to ask for a dystopic vision because let's just like flesh it out right here. Lovely. So the edges expanding, as Gina um, yeah, um, mentioned, and then not just visual art, but also music as well. Thank you. So who wants to share a dystopic future? Yeah, so like, wow, that's amazing. So really leaning into the technologies, the AI, but in a social way, like in teens, right? Still in Chinatown. Amazing. Let's take one more back there. Yeah, I mean, the whole boba phenomenon. We love boba, but as you're speaking, I'm imagining Chinatown with nothing but boba shops, right? Because like really leaning into consumer demand or shabu shabu places, right? Without mochi, mochi donuts, so good though, but you know, um, without the cultural richness, right? And so the dystopic vision also helps us sort of prepare or kind of counteract, right, the types of cultural landscapes that we want to, I don't know, avoid, right, address in a way. Um, you brought us here, so can you take us out? <laughs> <laughs> One thing I want to name, well, there weren't a lot of a lot of folks who went dystopian. I was telling Lily and surprising her, I guess, that I go dystopic first. And I think that's something and then I and then I go and lean into the dreaming big of what it would look like with, like radically. And it's important to name that that is a skill to be built through cultural planning. Like with, with our residents, when we do art making and design, the first question might be like, um, but what's my budget? And like what, like it's it's very practical, real important questions. Um, but the the what do you take that? The leap of faith to imagine, the emotional labor it takes to imagine and know that you might be disappointed. All of that is a skill in like divergent thinking, creative thinking that we all need to flex. That artists really help us tap into and build as a muscle, as a whole neighborhood. And that's what's exciting about this cultural plan too. So thank you everybody for stretching your muscles um, with us. Do you wanna, should we talk to? We, we can. So Gina just modeled for us how to do engaged, right? Um, imagination and planning. I mean, that was amazing. We didn't need paper, pen art supplies, we just did it, right? And 
some of us we met for the first time. So thank you. Um, I'd also love to hear from Lydia and Cynthia, how do you do engagement in the work that you do? What does it look like? Well, we were talking about this before we started tonight that there are, have been different waves and different projects of um, kind of cultural community engagement. And I guess I've been more involved in the engagement that's more protest oriented, <laughs> uh, coming out of my 30 years of community organizing. One of the first things, but actually as I transitioned, I formerly worked for the Chinese Progressive Association, which is a direct action grassroots organizing group. And I left that group uh, to go work for the land trust. So in 20, I think it was around 2015, as I was making that transition, when the land trust had first started, we launched an effort to reclaim public land in Chinatown and really raise awareness in the community about where is the public land, why is it public? Why does it belong to us? What do we want to do with it? And as part of that campaign, we brought together residents and artists um, to look at each parcel and, and do some kind of art project on each public parcel in Chinatown. So we had like a dance performance and a little um, pop-up library installation at the Chinatown gate. And then we had a uh, little sardine can art um, about a Chinatown library at the China Trade Center, which now has the Chinatown library. Uh, we had a mural and recorded uh, oral history um, stories at the parcel 12C, which is now undergoing a public visioning process. And um, we had an installation called Remain that was made out of caution tape um, on parcel R1, which is now being developed by the Asian CDC for uh, all affordable housing and the permanent library. Um, so, you know, I think that we do have some history of finding different ways that people can engage and envisioning. And, you know, we do like traditional kinds of charrettes and community workshops as well, but um, the cultural piece is really important to that. I think for us, there's a couple different ways we do quote unquote community engagement. Um, you know, I think certainly with the artists that we work with, especially through our residency programs, the artists we support are very process oriented, who have an interest and, you know, demonstrated articulate um, kind of desire to learn from interactions with community members or people in this neighborhood. Um, I'm, I'm being deliberately vague because it's often very defined by the artist. Um, but, you know, even in other ways, I think we have the advantage. I mentioned that we're embedded in a social service agency. So in many ways, when we work with other programs in BCNC that are direct service, and they have a need that they have their con um, community and their constituents have a need that we can kind of embed that creative or support with creativity and artistic practice. That in many ways is also community engagement. Um, we work very closely, for example, with our family services department. One of the major um, issues in Chinatown is um, uh, gambling cessation and providing alternate, um, uh, alternate healthier entertainment activities for um, individuals. And, you know, we host karaoke nights with family service department. So we have, we have, we're, we're kind of in that way addressing needs and providing um, support to our neighborhood or the API community or AAPI community. Um, and in many ways, in that way, it's, it's, it's because of our structure, our unique structure that we're able to respond that way. Um, I think that's all I'll share for now. <laughs> yeah, as, as you two were speaking, it just really struck me about the multi-generational aspect of the community planning and the art and culture-based engagement that has occurred like from, I mean, Lydia, the history that you draw on where um, government agencies cleared, they took land, you know, from Chinatown residents and cleared them, right? Evicted them um, with barely any compensation. And then the fact that the land stayed vacant 
for decades and the highway didn't get built. They didn't use the land. And so then the Asian CDC coming in, building affordable housing, the a branch of the Boston Public Library, you know, Gina, you and your team putting the Chinatown Stoop project there, right? Rebuilding that stoop culture that was lost decades later. And some of the people who enjoy it are the same but many of them are long gone, you know, and yet you're still serving working class, you know, API communities, as well as others, you know, who um, have a special connection to Chinatown. And so there's this iterative and kind of continuous nature um, of the work that you share that's really incredible um, and just speaks to the value of collective action, you know, and just making connections and continuing to kind of build out the public realm together. Um, so thank you for those lessons. Um, I'm gonna turn to the audience now to see if anybody has any questions or any, um, actually let's let's do questions because when you ask for comments, it gets unwieldy, right? Questions, please. Sure. Yeah, So the question was, what are the biggest challenges in engaging the community and doing uh, cultural planning? Where to start? <laughs> um, I'll just say some buckets as my mind is processing and then focus more, if folks want to chime in. Uh, one big bucket is accessibility, like language accessibility, um, interpretation translations, and also language accessibility as I speak fluent English and I show up to these planning meetings and I'm like, what are you saying? And we, and the, what, what the practice was back when we had in-person planning meetings was um, like I used would like huddle up with table and on our tables and they would pass me notes like, what does this mean? Define this. And it'd be like, you're in class and you have to learn on the spot to keep up with the conversation of what folks are, or what city officials are asking you for what you want in your neighborhood. Um, and so that's that's the challenges of traditional community planning and engagement in, in Boston. And what we're building alternatively, it's really easy to say what you don't want. It's harder to say what you do need and what you do want. What we are actively building is a different way of planning where you're not going to the source of power, which is like the city planners holding this community meeting. Um, you're actually without them, just among yourselves, we have dinner, we have dinner, we have interpretation, we have childcare, we have artist facilitators, and we are having the conversations, learning about the land's history. Um, we are like imagining what the land is going to look like, and then the residents come out with their vision um, or drafts of their vision. And then when we put out exhibits in public art form, we invite the city officials to come on our terms on the weekend or times when our community members can make it. And you're flipping the power dynamics in that way. And that's, um, I guess, a challenge and one way of so solving that. Yeah, I think we have to take charge a lot of times and set the terms ourselves. I think another, what I see as one of the biggest challenges actually is that people have to feel that the planning makes a difference and that they're they're using their time well because especially Chinese immigrants are very practical. <laughs> they're not into wasting a lot of time just dreaming and visioning unless they're like, you know, are they gonna do this? <laughs> Um, so I think that's been a real big struggle a lot of times because we're trying to like encourage people to be involved and people are like, we come to meetings, we come to meetings, we talk and talk and I don't see anything happening. Um, but I think that over the last 10 to 20 years, I think we have some real tangible results to point to in Chinatown. And that um, is encouraging if people have been around long enough to see that. And a lot of people are newer or younger and they haven't maybe gone through the whole history, but we can kind of remind people or re retell that history so that the people can see that it really, there really can be results. 
think Lydia, you referred to this, you know, 10, 20 years, we saw results. And I think that's, it's time building that trust and building the relationships with the individuals that we want to engage because of this, like, because they're not going to waste their time. They, but um, I, I think the unique part of what we're doing with this process is each organization and each group has relationships with um, parts of the community that maybe, I mean, there's certainly a lot of overlap, but there's also a lot of distinct relationships that we all hold. And by thinking about this together and coming together, we can kind of try to tackle that and tapping into the, the constituencies, the constituents that we work with or um, the people we serve. Yeah, one other challenge I'll name is just like capacity. Um, there are very real limitations on capacity, on all of our capacity, on like you're by saying yes to this, you're saying no to something else. And that's essentially what we're all doing, showing up to these meetings and planning conversations. And so for our residents, um, it's not a lack of investment or a lack of urgent need or vision. It's really a lack of the time resource and like capacity. And one thing that this cultural, what we're hoping to structure out and name in this cultural planning process is how can we be creative about increasing neighborhood capacity? It doesn't always have to be the same groups of people, the same residents, the same organizers, like having the conversations, we can leverage different folks. And um, this is also an invitation to you all as Sasaki mostly <laughs> employees um, in this office that's in Chinatown too. Um, there's a lot of great potential of leveraging the like being creative about who is in the community. How can we all chip in to increase neighborhood capacity and take the burden off of folks who um, have limited capacity? I mean, the what you're saying about those who are very practical about how they use their time they're the ones whose input is actually really valuable as well in the cultural plans, right? Because people who need childcare, people who are tired from working, right? People who are facing tenuous housing situations. And so making sure there's childcare available, make, making sure the food is good, um, you know, making sure that there's very visible results of what they're doing, but making sure that, you know, like they feel welcome, held, all those things. Um, yeah, it's it's not it's not easy. And so the way you're kind of spelling out the challenges for us also helps us think about what the ingredients are, right, for effective community engagement. It really has to work for the people who struggle the most. And then for people who don't face those same time and resource bur burdens, how do we show up, but in a way that doesn't dominate, right? How do we show up as allies and accomplices? And I think this is all work that we have to do like self-wise, but also relationally to really figure that out in places like Chinatown, downtown, neighborhoods that are changing so fast. Um, thank you, you asked a really generative question. <laughs> Let's take another one. Um, I'm going to go to the back just because they're not being, um, they're being overlooked. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. So to summarize the question, there are different groups that, you know, comprise a community. And so when you do this kind of cultural planning, how do you balance the needs of different groups? I mean, I think we different groups within Chinatown and different kinds of people are interested in different issues. So for our organization, we have many different ways of involving people. Some people are really interested in uh, energy justice and the and the microgrid and um, what that means. Some people are really interested in low income housing and other, you know, so there are different, there have to be different entry points. 
but they do come into conflict sometimes. Like there's a conflict about parking. A lot of people, you know, we're trying to be environmentally friendly and decarbonize. And so we're not thinking about parking so much, but people still have cars and there's still a lot of people who want more parking in Chinatown. But, you know, there's a also this balance like parking, affordable housing, you know, they're both expensive to build. Where do you, where do you put the dollars? So those are ongoing debates. And I don't think there's any one answer and probably each of us and each of our organizations may focus differently. Um, you know, we kind of openly bias ourselves towards the less privileged in the community, but um, but we think there has to be a role for everybody. And I actually think one of the most important things for us to do as a community is to build community so that people coming from different backgrounds actually talk to each other and debate some of these issues together so they get to know each other. and. Um, you have developed some sense of accountability, which was really lost, I think, in the last, really since urban renewal on. Everybody talks about how Chinatown before urban renewal was this wonderful community where everybody knew each other and everybody related because it was also tiny. That's part of it. But I think there, there really is something about what was lost since then. And um, it's by getting, getting the wealthy English-speaking residents to talk to some of the and learn about what the issues are of the immigrant workers is really important so that they'll, you know, they won't just always be at odds, but they may start to support each other in some ways. I, I, this is not gonna exactly answer your question, but I think Lydia, what you said is completely right. Like getting these different, uh, you know, getting people together to connect and speak. And that's part of what we do with our programs. I think for many of us, I can give you, this is a housing example, I guess. We did a program, a bilingual um, play reading last summer, and the theme was like gentrification. It was like an immigrant Chinese um, parent had bought a, a condo for their student or something. So it was a very low, loaded play, and it was presented in Chinese and English. And there was some healthy debate you know, after that reading, but that's the power. And then for many, I think maybe seeing something artistic or something creative is a safe entry point that you wouldn't necessarily start talking to your, a random person. Hey, so what do you think about that new luxury condo? <laughs> that's, you know, X percent occupied by whatever, you know, but art can, creative practice can really open the doors for that conversation. And that that's where we have to start. Yeah, there's one space that comes to mind, Hudson Street, which is a street a lot of us were referring to, displaced, taken over by the highway, fought back for like a decade and um, won back, now is housing, the Pow Art Center, all of this stuff. There is a small green space called One Greenway Park, and it's it's a great, very, very rare patch of grass in Chinatown. The challenge is that where Chinatown used to be, all these families where you knew everybody on the block. Now it's, uh, you have patchwork of residents. There are residents in the market rate housing. There are residents in the affordable housing, rental and condos that like that ACDC built. And then there's also um, like short-term like rentals across the street where those are like flipped, the row houses are flipped. And uh, it is a really short block of very a lot of different people. And you see the microcosm of that on that one Greenway Park, where it's supposed to be a green space, originally thought to be for the residents' families to be out enjoying green space, um, is really used more like a dog park and um, marketed as pet friendly <laughs> is what I've heard. And so um, there's a lot of tension. And so we've, if we have a public forum saying, Yes, dogs or no dogs, you enter the space adversarial. You enter in thinking whoever is not on my side is my neighbor, but also my enemy. So what public art allows is to enter in with, uh, with curiosity and empathy instead of just like polarized views. And so we, instead of, we sidestep that question because, and we started this public art process because so many residents came to us saying, it's not fair, I can't use that park because there's so much dog poop on it. Um, and so, but some of the, anyway. <laughs> so we, we had visioning sessions for the public art. And in that, 
it was great. We had dog owners who are affordable condo residents now sharing about how they were like one person shared about how she was displaced from Jamaica Plain and really loves living in Chinatown, wants to honor the neighborhood and the culture and wants to learn from folks because she knows what it's like to lose JP and having an exchange across languages and also naming, you know what, I hear what you're saying about dogs and I think that you should as a family also get to own, like share the space. And now they're working together to imagine. Um, that's not everybody, but the hope is that more folks get rebuild a coalition of folks who really, because they're held accountable to each other, start working together to solve these issues. Yeah, I, everywhere. When we um, were doing a campaign to reclaim parcel R1, which is now gonna be in, in development, one of the youth drew a little postcard that people could sign you know, saying why we want R1 back for the community, what is it that we want to see? And the graphic on the postcard was of a happy little community and somebody was walking a dog there. And the elderly, some of the elderly looked at the postcard, they're like, what's that dog doing there? Get that dog out of the picture. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's cultural differences. You're working through a lot of cultural differences and rate and class differences. Absolutely, thank you. It's a very rich conversation. We'll take a question from here. What does it mean? What does it mean to see your boss a culturally based neighborhood? Should it have edges? Uh, you know, how open is it? So um, sort of a reflective question of, you know, Chinatown, I'm, I'm just reiterating or trying to, so for people who can't hear, um, you know, as, as a place that's very val uh, rich and meaningful, um, but what does it mean to Boston more, you know, more broadly? And then what are the implications for how we expand or how we, you know, just think about the space of Chinatown? Is that fair? Yeah, I think Yeah, and does the city try to protect it somehow? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly the question we're asking. We're saying, you know, isn't Chinatown actually really worth something to the city of Boston? And what's the city going to do to protect it? But I just wanted to mention that the history of Chinatown, it was organic in the sense that people were um, banded together for safety from racial violence. Uh, I just want I just want to because we were sidebarring actually while they're visioning we're talking about the you said to other Asian communities what are other people's relationships with Chinatown um, I'll share a quick example I think for other um, non Chinese Asians you know Chinatown still has resonates and creates a sense of belonging when we during the pandemic we did this we love Boston Chinatown letter writing campaign. And some of the letters were like, you know, I'm not Chinese, I don't speak Chinese, but as an international student coming from the Philippines, for example, this is where I bought ingredients that made me feel like I could do that cook, cook food from my home. When I'm on the streets of Chinatown, I feel like I belong somewhere. So um, I just wanted, I thought that was actually something really important. And Lydia and I had been saying like, you know, that's part of, you know, that's part of the cultural dish. It's for them too. It's for, it's, you know, so it is not just for um, Chinese individuals. Yeah. Um, a metaphor I often think back to that I heard from someone who does this work in the West Coast was, like when you go to an Asian household, 
most Asian households, you would go and you're not Asian if you don't practice this, you would take your shoes off if their house is a no shoe house. And you kind of understand that, like even if you don't do that in your own household. So they were saying how they were doing the series of performances out in um, Little Tokyo. And it was called, welcome to Little Tokyo, now please take your shoes off. And it was inviting people who are now residents and have a claim and have a, um, are, should be heard for their vision of the neighborhood because they're residents too. And then how do you, as a new resident, honor the practices, the um, recognize that there is someone, it's a home for someone before you made it a home for yourself too. And what can you do to learn about that? And I feel like the complicated thing that we're hoping to learn and explore is what is Chinatown culture? Like you were saying how um, preserving it and uh, expanding Chinatown culture and the cultural edges. Something that we're also having to explore is, um, Culture is evolving, the demographics are evolving, and there are working class residents who are also ACDC residents in our units who are not Chinese, who are not Asian. There are also like white and black and brown residents that we also want to um, have centered in the conversation because uh, we want to center residents most at risk of displacement who need the working class accessibility of Chinatown. So how do we have like honor the history of the Chinatown immigrant working class history and make space for folks who don't identify as Chinese or Asian. Thank you. Gina, I think um, your comment about who makes up Chinatown and who is served by Chinatown is so, um, I mean, that resonates with me so much because I'm a I'm Korean American and I come from Los Angeles. And um, Chinatown means something to me because I grew up in an ethnoburb, what they call an ethnoburb, where I was surrounded by people like me. And my mom barely learned how to speak English. Sorry, no, no offense, mom, if you're listening, but she didn't really need to speak English to have a full life, you know, because she's surrounded by other Asian people. And in Boston, it's just not like that, you know. And but when I come to Chinatown with my son now, who doesn't know the life of being a Korean American from LA, which is unfortunate for him. Um, he comes here and he sees, you know, Asian aunties speaking Cantonese real loud, you know, unabashedly just in their in their fullness, you know, and to me, that's really important. Right. And um, the other thing I want to say about Chinatown is that it's the fact that it's for everybody and the way that ACDC has, you know, the, the members and the community members in such an inclusive way, it's such a beautiful thing. And I think it's a model for so many neighborhoods in Boston where we center the core, the long-term residents, but we also make space, but always in a way that's deeply equitable. Um, in, in LA's Koreatown, some of the radical organizations, the progressive organizations, like what used to be the Korean immigrant workers advocates, at some point they realized their workforce, they were Korean American and Latinx, just they had to change to Koreatown immigrant workers. I forget, A, it's not advocates anymore. It's like all of them. And so at some place, it's not just the ethnic group or the racial group, you know, it's the larger community. Um, and so this is why the questions that you're raising and you haven't given a straight answer about who's a cultural plan for, you know, because it sounds like it's emergent and it's contested and, you know, and that's like the beauty of planning is you never know what you're going to get right because the city and the people were constantly growing in a way. Um, I want to take further sort of closing comments from you and then turn it over to Marianne for her closing remarks. Why are you doing cultural plan? Like we need to be able to use it. And with all the change, like I, I don't want to have it's just another it's just another question. question, you know. I think that's why we haven't answered your question on who the cultural plan is for too. I think I've already talked a lot. I don't really have much else to say. Something that I want to explore is in light of the state of the city, we kind of talked about this before then, but in light of the state of the city last night, people might have different opinions on it. It does mean planning is going to look different 
hopefully, <laughs> in the city? And how do we leverage what's to come in changing in the city's change um, for our benefit? We're always talking about how we want planners to help us and engage with us, not because there's a development that wants to come to Chinatown, which is usually the case, but that we want planners to work with us to articulate it before even development is a part of the equation. Um, and so that's my closing comment, like looking forward to how this conversation evolves in light of what was announced and holding that accountable, holding the city and that planning agency accountable as well. Thank you. Should we bring up the chair for you? I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I, I thank you, everyone. We had a great turnout tonight. I want to especially um, thank Do uh, Dr. Lily Song for the moderation and, and getting her guidance and great questions for this conversation. I think that it's wonderful, Gina, to hear from you and our exercise that we did where we can think about using our imagination and creative leap of thinking of a place, understanding it from a utopic to a dystopic kind of uh, future that's really productive in the way that we're thinking about planning. Um, I think that what also spoke to me is this idea of how do we, um, as participants, as, as being neighbors and in, in, of um, Chinatown residents um, for the Sasaki Foundation and Sasaki, how are we part of a culture that is about empathy and compassion and ways that we're really listening and learning from each other? I think, Lydia, the history of Chinatown that you've talked about, um, how planning that actually can can make a difference, that there's a practicality to it um, in ways that we can learn from our history, um, react to that history, but also think about the future. And then Cynthia, for you engaging through creative processes of thinking about art, bringing people together to connect. And then a personal favorite of what I've just heard is, um, what would our love letters be to Chinatown? Right. If we were to all write love letters to Chinatown in the way that we experience it, um, how what would that be? I feel like we should send you some letters. Um, and so I think it's just wonderful to have these events so that we can learn more from those who are experts um, within their neighborhoods, within the city processes, and really get guidance from others um, to be better um, participants in planning and design processes. I want to thank all of you um, for being part of this really important conversation on cultural planning in Chinatown. I've learned so much tonight. I hope you all have too. Um, please stay tuned for more Sasaki events as we continue to have conversations like this. Hopefully we'll have this group back to talk about all of their ongoing work um, and hopefully we can be there in any way we can to support and amplify um, your voices and all of the wonderful, um, you know, fantastic work that you're doing. Um, thank you everyone. We hope if you have any other questions, feel free to talk to the panelists. Um, we're so happy to see you here and hope to see you again in the future. Thank you.